Hello and welcome back to Hot Topics, the DuraSpace Community Webinar Series. My name is Christy Searle and I will be facilitating today's session. Just a reminder that the chat window is available at the left side of your screen. At the end of the presentation today, we will be taking questions from our audience and we'll ask you to post your questions in the chat window at that time. We are pleased to have you with us today as we conclude our 12th Hot Topics series, Digital Preservation with Archives Direct, Ready, Set, Go. I'd like to welcome back the curators and presenters of this series, Artifactual Systems' Sarah Ramke and today's presenter, Courtney Muma, who will present today's webinar, Digital Preservation with Archives Direct, Go. So Courtney, I will turn things over to you to get us started. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today in this second in our series. So the first was Ready, Set, and Sarah Romke took us through um, that set of uh, slides and workflows. And now I'm going to actually give a little bit of a recap of what we talked about last time and then go through a demonstration of the Archivematica system um, that you will be using in the Archives Direct instance. So again, my name is Courtney, I'm an archivist and a librarian, and I'm in charge of the U.S. and international community development for Artifactual Systems, um, who are the creators of Archivematica and who have uh, put together Archives Direct in partnership with the DuraSpace group uh, in the DuraCloud team in particular. Sarah Romke, who is also an archivist and librarian and is a systems archivist with Artifactual Systems, is also, also with us today, and she'll give me a little break at the end um, and uh, handle most of the question and answer period. And so she'll be moderate, moderating that, and you'll hear a little bit from Sarah then. So first we're going to go over again just a, a review of what Archives Direct is. Um, a bit of a review of the last webinar content. So Sarah went over how we question our content, so those things that we need to preserve in our repositories, and then how we prepare that content for processing in Archives Direct for preservation and storage. Um, that's also a video that is available to you, and there should be a link at the end of the slides, and you can watch that one from last week. Um, in fact, it's at, uh, you can see there in the chat that Christy has put in the link for durispace.org slash hot topics. And that's where you can find uh, the first part of this web series. So then after I um, do a bit of a review, I'm going to do a demonstration of our two case studies that Sarah introduced last week. Um, the first being digitized content and the second being born digital material. And just walk through how you would process those in Archivematica <clears throat> that, again, is hosted in DuraCloud in the Archives Direct system. So first, what is Archives Direct? Archives Direct is a hosted service that's offered from DuraSpace. Um, it's, we offer support, training, and consulting from artifactual systems, since most of the work you'll be doing is processing digital content in Archivematica. Archivematica is hosted inside DuraCloud, and DuraCloud provides the hosting environment for processing as well as storage. And together, these two systems combined are standards-based digital preservation packages in secure long-term storage. So you're really getting everything that you need to make sure that your content is preserved and accessible for the long term. So last week, Sarah went through very detailed workflows. How you will, um, how would, how would you examine your content and understand your content before you would even approach using something like Archives Direct? So she went over first um, this idea of needing to really know your digital content. Is it born digital? Is it digitized? Do you have submission documentation and metadata that you need to include um, or add? So that means, do you have other systems where you're storing that? Do you want to preserve that? And by submission documentation, we mean things like donor agreements and accession forms that aren't content proper, but are content that you want to store alongside your preserved content. The reason that we look at our digital content and need to understand it is because ArchivesDirect offers many different workflows for your content. 
And so depending on what you have and your preservation and access needs, you would use a different kind of workflow for each of those. You also need to know, is your content stored locally? Is it in other systems? Is it in clouds or on detached media? Is it packaged somehow? Um, and by packaged, I mean things like, is it a digital forensic image? That's an entirely different workflow in Archives Direct. Uh, are they zipped or tarballed content? Are you using and ingesting bags that are bagged using the Library of Congress bagit specification? And then finally, you want to look at um, your content and understand, is it diverse formats? Um, do you have your, are your packages very large or very small, or is that, um, does that vary per collection? Um, so just having some knowledge before going in of the size and the amount of your content is really important. And again, if you go back and watch last week's slides, you'll see a lot of detail about how to examine your content. So last week, Sarah went through two scenarios. The first was the scenario of having digitized content. In this case, an institution has digitized master images provided by a vendor, a vendor and has the following goals. They need to preserve the digitization masters in an AIP. They need to create a DIP a dissemination information package, and that's your access copies, using Archivematica's normalization functionality. They want to include Dublin Core metadata in both their archival information package and their dissemination information package, so both in the stuff that they're storing and in their access copies. They want to have some Dublin Core metadata that in the case that I'll show you today, they're actually bringing in from another system. Although there is a workflow in Archivematica um, that allows you to go ahead and add Dublin Core for the package itself in a template. So our assumption when I go through this case study is that all of the content has been prepared according to the Archivematica documentation, which I'll show you, and the information that Sarah went over in Webinar 1 about how you get your content into ArchivesDirect using their DuraCloud sync tool. So that was case study one. The other case study that we went over was born digital content. And in this scenario, the institution has some content from a donor or another department which it wishes to preserve in archival information packages. They're not sure how they're going to provide access, but they know they want to make access copies and store them just in case they have a system later that they want to upload those access copies to and they want to make sure that the metadata is stored alongside those access copies that connects them to the stored archival information package in ArchivesDirect. So again, our assumption here is that the content has been prepared according to Archivematica documentation and to the step-by-step -step process that Sarah goes through in the first webinar in this series. And so now for the fun part. I'm going to go through demonstrations of, and I'll show you how you would walk through both of these workflows. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So I'm going to take a moment here to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Great. So right now I'm on the archivesdirect.org site. You can go here to learn more about ArchivesDirect since we've only provided a bit of summary information in this webinar today. With regard to workflows, if you need to know more information about the workflows we discussed today or any of the many other workflows that are available to you as a user of ArchivesDirect, you can go to archivematica.org here, and under documentation in this dropdown, you can go to the most current version of Archivematica, and you click on that. It takes you to our user and administrative manuals. And if you scroll down here, you'll see that we have many different workflows available to you. I'll stop here on digitized files. This digitized files here will describe to you 
um, much of the workflow for the case study one that I showed you. And you'll find a lot more interesting information here, including things about storing your access copies or your DIP. All right, so now let's go to the Archivematica dashboard. So I have already signed in to the Archivematica dashboard. This is what any user using ArchivesDirect would see when they logged in to their Archivematica dashboard and were ready to process content. So I'm going to give you a quick tour of the dashboard. Um, so across the top here, I'm going to refer to these as tabs. So if I say transfer tab, ingest tab, archival storage tab, etc., that's what I'm referring to across the top. Um, and then I'm going to show you down here, when I refer to a transfer, it's going to be this line with its UUID and its start time. And so this is multiple transfers here through the dashboard. You'll also see multiple SIPs in the ingest tab of the dashboard. Go ahead and collapse that. And so these are all individual SIPs in the ingest tab. SIP again is submission information package from OEIS. Any of these microservices, when clicked on, will expand to show you all of the separate microservices that have occurred during processing. And within each of those microservices, you can drill down even further by clicking on that line and seeing the individual jobs that the Archivematica server ran on your content. And so when I'm referring to transfers, microservices, and then jobs, that's what I'm talking about. But instead of starting at the beginning, we're going to jump over to the administration tab of the dashboard, which is our last tab here. In the administration tab of the dashboard, we see the first thing is processing configuration. So what I've done today for the purposes of demonstration is I've actually disabled a lot of the automated features in Archivematica. And that's because I want to illustrate for you where some of your workflow decisions might be made. However, I've left some of our defaults. For instance, we will not see the file transcription option, um, which is something that you could turn on in your dashboard if you chose to do so. We will not see the extract packages option because we won't be running through anything that's packaged today. But if you turned this off, then you would have the opportunity to ask um, to answer Archivematica when it asks you during the transfer process, would you like to unpack any of your zips or tarballs or forensic images? Um, and then it would even ask you a follow-up question, is, which would be, do you want to keep the content from that extraction um, and not the original package, or do you want to keep both? So I've just left those off for today. And I've, I've left off a reminder, and I've left off um, the compression algorithm and level choice. So you actually have some choices with regards to how you compress your archival information package before you put it in storage. This is really great for um, if you're really trying to conserve resources and use less storage space, you might want to use a higher compression level than the Archivematica default, which is sort of a medium compression level. All right, so there's a lot more here in the administration tab, but because I want to leave time for questions after the demonstration today, I'm not going to go through all of these, but please, if you have any questions at the end about any other administrative tasks in Archivematica, please do uh, ask. Um, again, you can ask your questions using the chat at any time um, during the presentation today, and then we'll get to them at the end. All right, so I'm going to go back to the transfer tab of the dashboard. So again, we're assuming that we've already done all of the configuration that we need to outside of the system, and we've uploaded our content from our wherever it is locally um, to our, our transfer source location in DuraCloud. And so Archivematica then has access to that content for processing. So the first, I'm actually going to work backwards today. And first I'm going to show you the more complex workflow. Uh, which is the born digital uh, workflow. And so this would be case study two. And then once we get to ingest, I'll go ahead and carry through the rest of the ingest with case study two and case study one that digitize content. 
and that way I'll be able to show you what that digitized content configuration looks like in the dashboard. Um, so you'll see I started case study one earlier. It's already made its way to the ingest tab and we will, re we will address that once we get to ingest. So I'm going to choose stand, uh, standard transfer type, but I want to show you here that if you click on this drop down, you'll see standard transfer. And this is just Archivematica expects a directory with content in it. It can be a directory with a lot of uh, different directories. It can be deep hierarchy. Um, and all of those or all of those can have content in them, digital objects, and they can be varied digital objects. Um, they don't have to be all one format. We expect diverse content. So the only thing it has to be is even if you only have one object, it has to be in a directory for Archivematic to understand it. Sarah goes into um, discussion of exactly how you configure that using the DuraCloud sync tool in the first webinar. So please do go back to that. Other workflows are unzipped and zipped bags. So I described that earlier that that is the Library of Congress bag it specification. So you can have bagged content that you ingest through Archivematica. Um, DSpace is an export from DSpace, and you can learn all about that workflow um, using our Archivematica documentation that I showed you on archivematica.org. And then disk image is referring to forensic disk images. Um, if you have any questions about that workflow, please do ask them during the QA. Um, we won't go into detail about it today, but it is also documented on that archivematica.org. So again, we're going to select stand standard transfer. I'm going to go ahead and name this transfer Case Study 2. Now I can assign an accession number here or take an accession number that I've created using an another system like Access to Memory or Archive Space, for instance. But I don't have to include an accession number. I have to include a transfer name, but accession number is a choice. Here is a list of transfer source locations. In this case, I've only got one transfer source location set up. I could have multiple locations here. Um, if you're using the Dura Cloud Sync tool, the way that Sarah instructs you, then you can absolutely set up multiple areas in your transfer source location. Um, perhaps you have a digitized contents folder and a born digital contents folder. Um, so this is just, again, navigating through a directory where you have all of your content for uh, processing that needs to be processed. Once you select transfer source location, click Browse. And then you can browse within that content to the content that you wish to process. So I'm going to select this images folder here by clicking on add. Notice that when I expand the images folder, I have another level of directory here. Um, I could also choose this if I wanted to. But once I go below pictures, you'll notice that there aren't any other directories. And we don't show the objects in this browse. So I'm going to choose the images level and click add. And you'll see now it's shown up here. Now I can continue adding from this or other transfer source locations and do multiple transfers at a time if I choose to do so. But for the sake of the demonstration, I'm just going to go ahead and start. And again, we're, we're assuming that this is case study to our born digital content. So once I hit this green button, now our server is going to start processing this content. You'll see that we get a bell icon here when it shows up in the dashboard. And this means that Archivematica is waiting for us to make a decision. And our decisions can be made using these drop-down menus. So you'll see here we have a choice to approve or reject the transfer. I'm going to go ahead and click approve. And this is basically just a fail-safe, so if you accidentally start a transfer, for instance, that's very large, you don't have to go through all of these microservices and take up a lot of processing um, resources if, if it's not the thing that you wanted to transfer. So it's just a really quick opportunity to abandon ship if you've made a mistake early on. <laughs> okay, 
So I'm going to walk you through some of these microservices. Um, they go from bottom up, so the ones that were first are down here, so you'll see that we approved the transfer. And um, then we go through several microservices, some of which are for the machine to understand and process the content properly. And some of these are actually preservation events that are recorded in premise metadata in our METS XML document that is created. And so I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll just show you a few. So the transfer has been renamed with a, universe, a unique universal identifier, and file identifiers and checksums have also been assigned. There's a workflow that you can read about in our documentation that also allows you to include checksums with your content. And in that case, not only do you have Archivematica generating checksums, but it also verifies those transfer checksums for you. Um, you see here that we have a quarantine option that you might have noticed during our administration review is disabled, but quarantine allows you to basically set aside content while your virus definitions update. This is very useful for things that are coming from contemporary systems um, into your possession, and then they need to be preserved, but you want to make sure that you're not ingesting viruses. So 30 days is usually the standard there if people are using quarantine. And then as soon as it comes out of quarantine, the virus scan, of course, is the next thing that happens. Now I want to point out, if there was an error here, this line would turn red, or sort of a pink, some people have told us. And if that's the case, then this is the only microservice error that will actually cause the system to stop working. So if there's a virus, we will kick it out and off of the server and you will have to do something outside the system to deal with that. Any other error in Archivematica um, will still show up red on the microservice line, and then even further, once, for instance, if this one turned red, verify transfer checksums, and you expanded it, you would see another red job where that individual job had actually failed within that microservice. And in in the cases of any other error other than that scan for viruses, you can make a choice about continuing processing. So you can actually accept errors. And you can make those decisions by drilling down deeper into these task cogs, where you actually can see details about the command that was run and the output of that command. If this was an error, you would have a big red box that said ST error and you would actually be able to read exactly what the error was there. Okay, so we're at another decision point. This decision point is whether we want to generate a transfer structure report. Now I left this as a decision point, whereas normally it's disabled, um, because I wanted to point out something that Sarah brought out during her introduction to the case study. Um, she mentioned in her introduction to the case studies that one thing you want to think about with your born digital material is whether the quote-unquote original order is uh, valuable to you or not. Now, the original order, as it is in your file system, is reflected in the, the METS XML document, in the, um, the struct map of the METS XML document. However, um, we had some users who didn't want to parse that. They wanted an actual textual report of that directory structure of the original content. And so they added this generate transfer structure report, which runs a tool called tree in the background, which actually creates a text file that describes the directory structure of all of your transfer content. So I'm going to go ahead and select yes. And that way I'll have that text file, it'll take it all the way through to my AIP, and the users um, who actually funded that feature, what they do, or their plan at least, was to copy out that content from the text file and include it in their scope of content for their, for their description. Alright, so notice that's completed successfully, we're now, um, then we cleaned up names. I like to point out the clean up names microservice just to make it clear that we're sanitizing file names so that the system can process properly and the tools can run properly. Um, however, all the original names of the files are maintained in that XML document. So now we're on identify file format. 
And this is another one of those preservation events that's, of course, um, recorded in our premise metadata that's included in the Nets XML. And this is allowing us to decide what tool we would like to use to identify the formats in our content. The default in Archive Manica is FIDO. FIDO uses PRONOM identifiers, PRONOM being the registry from the National Archives in the UK. Um, so that's what I'm going to choose here, but notice you can also skip. Um, if you do choose to skip, um, this is often because you want to run um, your identification microservice in ingest rather than in transfer. And I can describe to you during the question time if you're interested why someone might want to do that. You can also choose file extension, uh, which we sometimes people use if um, FIDO doesn't recognize formats because they don't have pronom identifiers, which means they're not in that pronom registry, and they don't have the time or the inclination to wait until pronom is updated, either with their recommendation or by another recommendation. So they just need to get some stuff processed, and sometimes file extension is a good way to do that. But again, we recommend using FIDO. In the new version, um, we're going to also have another tool called Siegfried, which is in some cases a little bit faster than FIDO we find, but it's a newer tool. Um, and that tool is going to be available again in the newer version. So um, another microservice that we'll see happen here is that I want to point out is characterize and extract metadata. Uh, characterize and extract metadata runs FITS, which is File Information Toolset from Harvard, that runs a series of tools that characterize your content and extract metadata from that content. Now, FITS isn't always the tool that runs here. Sometimes other tools, um, such as FFProbe and Exif Tool, run. Um, and those tools run in particular for certain audiovisual content. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art did work with us and did some testing with us that helped us um, figure out that some audiovisual formats got better results from characterizing and extracting metadata using other tools. And so Archivematica recognizes that and goes ahead and calls up those other tools when we need them here. Um, after characterization and extraction of metadata, we have validation, and this is running Jove right now. And now we're at the examine contents microservice. And I just want to describe quickly what that is. Examine contents was added for our digital forensic image ingest. However, it works on everything, so it doesn't have to be a forensic image. And it's running a tool called Bulk Extractor. And Bulk Extractor creates a series of what it calls features, which are really just uh, text, the text file reports um, for finding things like emails and uh, social security numbers, uh, phone numbers, that sort of thing. I'm going to go ahead and run it just to show you that it's a relatively fast tool. Um, so even though we have a small set of content right now, you'll notice that Bulk Extractor runs rather quickly. And now we're at the final stage of our transfer set of microservices, complete transfer. And what's going to happen now is Archivematica is going to ask us whether we want to go ahead and send this particular set of content along with all of the METs that's been generated so far and all of the logs that have been generated during processing um, into our ingest workflow immediately, or whether we want to do some arrangement. Now, if we were to do some arrangement, we would want to choose to send this content to our backlog, and then we would it would be indexed using Elasticsearch, and then we could call it up later and do some arrangement. I'll show you some of the arrangement workflow using something I've already got in the backlog, but I'm going to go ahead and create a single SIP from this, and that means that I know that my transfer set of content has a one-to-one -one relationship with the SIP, the Submission Information Package, and um, ultimately the AIP, the Archival Information Package that we're creating. So I'm clicking Create Single SIP and continue processing. You'll see that it's working, it's got these double arrows happening over here, and now it's completed successfully. So now notice that our ingest tab has now two up at the top, and that means we have two decisions that are waiting here in ingest. And so this is where I'm going to take the opportunity to pause. Again, remember, remember I started case study one, which was our digitized materials um, before the, we began today. 
And so these are SIPs down in this workflow that you'll notice looks a lot like our transfer workflow. This here, um, where we see originals and the range, this is what we call our arrangement panel. And if you have sent content to the backlog, which you saw in that decision point at the last step in the transfer set of services, you would be able to search them here using this search interface, which you can see is multifaceted. I'm going to go ahead and do a generic search because I'm aware that I only have a few things in this backlog. But you can search, for instance, if you had included a session number, um, you can search on file extension, the date you ingested it, sort of that sort of thing. And we've also got keyword and phrase searching available. So notice when I did this search, my results show up here in my originals panel. And You'll see that earlier today, I sent this one, which is our, di our digitized sample, which is identical to the set of content that I've included in our case study one transfer. If I expand that, I want to show you in objects. This is the directory structure that um, the documentation would describe you to create, describe for you to create if you use the set of uh, the workflow that Sarah described in the first webinar. So if you go back to that um, and watch that webinar and then you read over the instructions that we have in our documentation, what the user would have done was create a structure that included these two folders called access and service. And what these are, um, in objects at the top level, these are the originals. So these would be their digital originals. But they had also created, or their uh, vendor might have created, access copies of those original folders. So notice here that we've got four GIFs. And you'll see that the file name is the same, but the extension here is different. And then their vendor might have also created service copies. These are also known as mezzanine copies in many places. And the idea behind a service copy is that um, any kind of migrations that you would do would be based on these rather than on your original. So, you know, in some cases, maybe they've done some alter alteration of a photograph um, or done some redaction, for instance. And you'll notice again, the file names are the same. So I wanted to show you that, but I also wanted to show you another part of that case study one, digitized materials, was that Sarah indicated that there were um, Dublin Core, object level Dublin Core metadata from another system that that institution wanted to include. And so when they were configuring their transfer, they also included this metadata folder that included this CSV right here that includes file labels for the objects within their transfer. Notice it's grayed out. That means you can't do any changes here. And this is, again, I just wanted to show you this contents because this is identical to what we're processing here. This is our digitized content. And so this is one of the workflows in Archivematica where you absolutely have to do some configuration prior to bringing it into the system so that the system can understand when it sees access or service um, directories that are in the proper place. That, that it doesn't have to make access copies for you and that it needs to use these service copies to generate any kind of migration that you, you might want to do. Okay, and um, quickly I just want to go back to the arrangement workflow. So if I wanted to construct a SIP and therefore an APE that did not have a one-to-one -one relationship with my original transfer content, then I would use this I would call up my stuff from my transfer backlog, so these are all my transfers in the backlog, and then I could take all or some of the content from any of these to create a new SIP over here in the Arrangement tab. And I would do that just by adding a directory. Call it new SIP. And you'll see now that I've got a directory here called new SIP. I've got one that I started earlier, um, so you can actually start and then come back later at any point and continue working if you haven't gone and 
um, all the way through to adding it back into your ingest process. And then in this new step, I'm going to go ahead and pull over all of this, transfer, I can drop one object, and then maybe from this transfer, I want to drop an entire folder of objects. I can also add multiple levels, so if I wanted to add another directory and embed it anywhere in here, I could do that. So I could have um, multiple levels in my hierarchy of my new set. I could also view many of these as long as I have a browser viewer. So you could click on something, surround it with that red box, and click view file, and it would go ahead and allow you in another browser um, to view that file if you had a viewer, and if not, it downloads it so that you can view it using your system and using tools that are available to you on your system. You can do the same thing for viewing logs. These are bulk extractor logs, so these are those examined contents logs that create those text files of things like credit card numbers uh, and emails like I described to you earlier, but you can't change them. So you can't change any of your metadata or your logs. They just get carried through. Even if you only take one object from a transfer, they get carried over into the new SIP. Once you're done creating your new SIP, you just highlight it with that red box, and you click Create SIP, and it heads right on down into your ingest set of microservices, which you'll see below. So that's why you might want to choose the transfer backlog option, especially for that case study number two when you have formed digital materials and you might not know very much about them when you're doing processing um, in your ArchivesDirect system. Alright, so I'm just going to go ahead and refresh this so I can get rid of my search. And you see there, there's that new SIP we created, it's ready to be processed. I'm just going to leave that hang out there for a minute and go back down case study B1. So again, this was our digitized content. We showed you in the arrangement tab how that was uh, set up so that the system understood it as such. So in the case of digitized materials where I've already got access copies and I've already got my service masters so I just need to create an EIP and preserve it, I'm going to go ahead and choose not to normalize. So in this case, the system won't be doing any migration to new formats because again, our vendor has already prepared those for us. We're just going to create an AIP that has the originals and our service masters and all of our metadata and logs. And then we're also going to create um, a, a DIP, and that DIP is going to have our access copies that we provided. So I'm going to select Do Not Normalize, and it's going to carry through the set of services um, that I'll complete for you using our Born Digital case study. And that should take us right to um, quarter two, and we'll have lots of time for questions. So, case study two was our um, was our born was our born digital case study, and so I'm going to go ahead in this case and use the existing data. See, it's asking us whether we want to run format identification here, and I mentioned format identification during transfer. You have an option. To skip it during transfer and run it, and I wanted to show you where that would happen during ingest if you chose to do so. In this case, though, if you'll remember, we chose to run FIDO during transfer, so I'm going to go ahead and use that existing data because I'm going to trust FIDO here. Now it's going to run through another set of services until we get to the point where we're ready to do normalization. Now, by default, we recommend in Archivematica, especially for born digital materials, that you choose to do normalization for preservation and access. So that means that you're going to have an AIP that has your original content, um, all the logs and the metadata that's created, all of the preservation metadata in that METS file, um, and anything that you add using any of our templates. And then that gets bagged using the Library of Congress bag it specification and then stored in your Duracloud instance. And then um, in the case of the case study 2 that Sarah brought up last week, this institution wanted to make access copies. Um, so 
they weren't sure what they were going to do with them. They didn't have a system to upload them to, but they wanted to have the excess copies and have those related to the stored preservation copies. So in this case, we are going to go ahead and memorize the preservation of that fact. Now I did mention our template. While it's normalizing, I'm going to go ahead and just show you those, although we're not going to add anything. If you click on the template icon here, you'll see that you can add premise rights and restrictions for packages. And they can be based on anything like copyright, statute, license, donor policy, etc. And then for each of those bases, you can actually add multiple acts as well. And if you hover here long enough, you'll see that these acts are things like migration, modification, dissemination, etc. Another thing that you can do in that template is add Dublin Core metadata. So this is very simple Dublin Core metadata. And again, this is Dublin Core that applies at the package level. If you wanted to include metadata at the object level for simple or complex objects, then we have workflows for both of those. And you have to configure your transfer so that Archimedica understands that that CSV file is metadata for the objects within. I'll go ahead and hop back to index since we should do that. And normalization has completed. There are two ways to review here. You can review using the report function. So if I open up our report here, I'm having computer difficulties, my apologies. You've got your normalization report, but you've also got this um, ability to actually review your normalized content, which is a little better because I can give you a look into what your um, AIP is eventually going to look like. So this is case study two, our born digital material. If we look into the dip, these are our access copies. You'll notice that access copies have their original um, file name and it's prepended by that UUID that's been assigned. And you can view these in the same way that you can review objects during our arrangement process. So if you have a browser, these will open up in a browser if you double click them. So there we have some marbles. Or they'll download if you don't have a browser viewer for that content. So those are our access copies. But we can also look at our preservation originals and copies. So since we normalize for preservation and access, we have our originals. And then you'll notice that the preservation copy of that original is a TIFF. So this was a bitmap. And our rule for bitmap is to make a TIFF for preservation. These rules, by the way, are all configurable. And during the QA, if you'd like to ask any questions about preservation planning configuration using our format policy registry, please do. So here is another one. We have this, um, this Adobe image. And it's been normalized to PDF for preservation. And again, you can open any of these. So if you're happy with the results of normalization, then you go ahead and approve that. <coughs> you have an opportunity to um, run preservation actions, like format identification, on your submission documentation as well. I'm going to go ahead and skip this for now. Um, the presumption is that often you'll probably know um, a lot more about your submission documentation because it's likely that it's something that you've arranged for. So if it's a donor form, it's a format that you've decided locally upon. And then just in the nick of time, we're at the end here where we're ready to store our AIP and to um, ultimately store our DIP as well. Now you'll see it says upload DIP here. That's because we have options for uploading your access copies to several integrated access systems. But in this case, um, our case study, we discussed the users didn't actually know what they were going to do with their access copies, so they just wanted to make them and store them. You can review your AIP. It looks a lot like how you review the results of normalization. So this is what your AIP looks like, this 7-zip 
file here is actually your zip DIP. You can download it from here if you click on it. You can also review your METs and you can validate it using the premise and METs validator created by the Dark Archive in the Sunshine State. Once you've reviewed it, you can go ahead and select Reject or Store. In this case, we're going to store our AIP. Oops. And this is storing it in DuraCloud. Um, so we would have a DuraCloud location or locations listed here. In this case, we've just got a default for demo. So I'm going to go ahead and store it to that location. And as soon as that completes and lets me know when it turns all green and lets me know everything went well, I'm going to go ahead and also store my dip. You'll see that it's indexing, that's using Elasticsearch, so that our archival storage is actually searchable using that Elasticsearch index of our Mets XML. All right, so our AIP has been stored successfully. I can now store my dip as well. And it's going to ask me in a moment where I want to store that. And these would also be pre-configured locations. In this case, this is by default. And again, keep in mind a lot of these processes could be automated. So a lot of the decision points we saw, once you know your workflows, you can skip through many of them. But in a nutshell, that's how you process in Cosmatica for those two different uh, case studies. Case study one, the digitized material, we would continue in much the same way that we did with our case study two. Archival storage then is searchable, again using that Elasticsearch index up here. You can also show files rather than showing the entire package if you wish to. Some of them actually have thumbnails that were generated during processing, as long as there are rules for that. You can download them from here as well. Um, and then that's everything I wanted to show you. Um, there's a lot more to Archivematica and to Archives Direct, so I hope you have some questions that Sarah can field and I can take a glass of a drink of water. I'm losing my voice a little bit, <laughs> so my, my apologies. Thanks Hi everyone, it's Sarah here. Oh, sorry, Christy, go ahead. No, it's okay, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has um, questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, up on the screen there, Christy has put up um, the websites for archivesdirect.org and archivematica.org, so you can take a, a note of those if you'd like to check them out. And just while people are thinking about their questions, I'll just mention that um, what Courtney and I have described in these last two webinars are, are two potential workflows, but as Courtney mentions, there's many others. Um, there's, there's not one right way to do, um, to use this system. There's many possible workflows. Um, and, and the workflows available in, in the Archivematica documentation are available for Archives Direct users as well. So um, hopefully taking a look through, the, through our website and documentation might give you some inspiration about how you could uh, make this system work for you at your institution. So I'll just give you some time to type in questions if you have any. We have a shy audience today, but that is a sign of a very effective presentation. And thank you so much, Courtney, for especially the live demo. I think that was very helpful. While we're waiting for some questions to come in, as Sarah mentioned, we have the websites available to you to get more information. Josh says there was a lot to take in, but it was very helpful. I couldn't agree more. Recording so I'll, will be available <laughs> if you'd like to rewatch. <laughs> uh, sorry, go ahead, Christy. Uh, this is Carissa, actually, Sarah. Oh, sorry, um, Carissa. Oh, sorry. 
No problem. I, I can't let you ladies off without asking one question, kind of just taking a step back for a moment. If you, one or both of you could reflect on maybe one, a, a workflow that's, um, that you've seen typically started as like the first, um, the first one to process. So is there, are there trends in terms of the type of collection that is the easiest to start with or one of the workflows that's the, 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 not necessarily the easiest, but maybe the most straightforward to to use with Archivematica and Archives Direct to to get people started. Um, just just one thought that came to mind. Sure. Um, I think that digitized content is a great place to start your digital preservation practice if um, using um, a new like a, if using this particular system is new to you or just doing digital preservation. Um, actions at all is, is a new process for your institution. And I have a couple of reasons for saying that. One is, um, in a sense, the stakes are a little bit lower because you have control over how you create those digitized copies, um, unless, of course, you're getting them from a vendor. But even still, um, digitized material just seems like um, just from my experience working with a lot of different users of Archivematica and a lot of different people delving into digital preservation, it's a little bit less intimidating than born digital work, um, which sometimes involves, um, you know, aside from all the technology parts, there's negotiations with your donor or with the, de the department or organization that created the material. There's just a, a lot to think about with born digital material. So I think digitized, um, material is a great place to start. It also tends to have um, a pretty, uh, most institutions will have very similar goals for their digitized content. They want to preserve their original masters, but they also want to, to create and provide access to access copies. Um, so having those sort of straightforward goals, I think, is really helpful. Um, and I see that Josh d does have a question, and I'll um, read it out. Um, one concern that he has is processing particularly born digital materials in the cloud is the security of unprocessed and possibly sensitive content. And can we envision a workflow where Archivematica is run locally and DuraCloud is used only to store encrypted AIPs? Um, I think there's a couple of potential um, answers to that, that question, Josh, and one of them um, has to do with, um, I guess, um, you could reframe the question as, is your material secure in DuraCloud before you create an AIP to begin with? Um, and Carissa, maybe if you don't mind popping your microphone back on, I, you might talk a little bit about some of the safeguards in DuraCloud. Absolutely. So um, DuraCloud by default is an administrative console. So you can, you have specific control of who has access to that material. And then DuraCloud provides an additional firewall and authentication uh, on top of just users and logins and, and general administration. Um, you can also take the next step and encrypt your content uh, as it's stored in DuraCloud. We don't provide any encryption services at this time, but you can certainly uh, store encrypted content uh, within your DuraCloud account as well. So those are just kind of some high-level things that DuraCloud uh, enables um, in terms of security of the content that's stored there. Great. And um, just to answer your question a little bit more directly, Josh, it absolutely is possible to run Archivematica locally and use DuraCloud just for your ape storage. You may have a number of reasons for doing that. Um, it may be um, just because of a local um, business need to process the, the material on a local Archivematica instance. Um, it might be because as an institution, you've decided that your DuraCloud uh, subscription is best used for your AIPs. Um, and you can do, um, we, could, we could work with Archives Direct clients to configure this um, kind of situation for them, um, I believe. Um, we could also, there's also users in the community who are already DuraCloud clients who are looking into this um, just on, on their own. Um, we have instructions in our user documentation on how to configure um, Archivematica to store things in DuraCloud and or use DuraCloud as a transfer source. Um, so that's available to anybody who is already a DuraCloud user and, and who wants to install Archivematica locally. 
as open source and uh, freely available software. We're, we're committed to allowing you to do that kind of um, work without necessarily um, using the, uh, the paid service in this way. Obviously, you'd need to be a JuraCloud subscriber, but... Are there any other questions from um, other participants? No problem, Josh. Thanks for your question. I'm getting the sense that there may not be any other questions from participants. Um, so I guess we could wrap it up there. Um, thank you all very much. And thanks to Courtney for the great live demo. Um, anybody who's done a live demonstration of software online knows that there's a tiny bit of nerve wracking um, of an experience to, uh, to make sure everything works smoothly. And I think that went really, really well. Um, and uh, if anybody would like to review it again, or for people who, who missed uh, the live demonstration, they can um, find the, the recording through the JuraSpace website. Thank, thank you. you. I'm behalf. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to thank Christy and Carissa. Thank you very much. Thank you both for presenting this series to our community and thank all of our participants for being here today. This concludes our session and you will be sent the link to the recording and presentation slides tomorrow afternoon. So this concludes our session. Please enjoy the rest of your day and thanks again, Courtney and Sarah. <laughs>